So welcome to our second invited talk. I'll just do a short introduction to Barbara Plank, who's giving it. I think I just skipped the slide here. Okay, let's go back. So uh, yeah, Barbara, whom I'm very uh, happy to, to greet here, uh, is a full professor at the Ludwig Maximilians in, uh, University in Munich. And she's also a full professor at the IT University in Copenhagen. And in Munich, where she has a, yeah, a full position, uh, she leads a research lab in natural language processing. And in Ho Copenhagen, she's a co-lead of the so-called NLP North team, who work together on solving various uh, fundamental and applied NLP problems. Uh, the main focus of her research is in making NLP models more robust, uh, so they can better deal with shifts in language uh, in data due to language variation. Um, she, her research output and impact, uh, I would say, is really impressive for our field. Uh, so I checked on Google Scholar, where she has more than 4,500 citations, H index of 34. And if I further mention just uh, uh, kind of highlights of the last few years, uh, from 2019, she's been an uh, advisory board member of the EACL. Uh, she was a co-author of a paper pre presented at uh, EACL 2021, which received an outstanding paper award. And in 2022, she received an ERC consolidation grant to work on the so-called dialect project, which investigates uh, natural language understanding and non for, for non-standard languages and dialects. So with this, uh, I would like uh, to welcome and ask you to welcome Barbara, and I will let her uh, get on with her talk. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks for the nice introduction. And I'm very happy to be here today. So really, really thanks for having me and inviting you over. <clears throat> Sorry, my voice. Um, so uh, I would, what I would like you to bring to, to you today is a little bit of a talk on some sorts of um, an important, what I believe is a very important topic in NLP and in computational linguistics, which we have started to work on quite some time ago, but I think we really need to go back and bring this topic much more into the front in order to advance AI or and NLP more broadly. So today, I hope uh, some of you find this interesting. So we'll give you like a little bit of a snapshot on this problem of human label variation and asking this question, hey, is this really so bad for AI? And here I really mean more mostly NLP, but I will touch up on other areas of NLP. Uh, it's, a, it's also relevant for other areas of AI more broadly. Now, let me see, I can just use the right laptops. Or can I use this one as well? Yeah, perfect. Awesome. All right. Um, so the typical pipeline is, um, you know, like looks like this, right? If we want to develop any kind of AI system, what we heard this morning as well is we need data. And so we need data and not just data, but typically also some sort of um, annotation or supervised signal because many of our tools look at supervised uh, uh, learning or self-supervised learning, but let's look at uh, supervised signals at the moment. So here is uh, an example where we need data and then we need algorithms that can take this data and learn from them. And the final thing is once we have this model, we need to ask ourselves, hey, how good is this actually, right? So there's this third fundamental concept in an AI pipeline where we need to talk about evaluation. And this is, you know, for language, computer vision, it's kind of the standard procedure where we develop or how we develop AI broadly. And why do I bring this up? Because I believe we need to zoom in into each of these three steps in order to move forward. And that's what I'm planning to do with this talk today as well. Um, but the problem which often appears is, look at this example here. Actually, it's behind me, right? Um, so if you look at this example and ask two people, how many sticks are there? How many? Yeah, seven, even three, four, right? Exactly. So we, we, can, uh, we can say, now two people say these two answers, right? And you know, you know this, uh, right? It's kind of uh, both are right and you know, wrong in the same way. So we know that um, we often observe 
that when we ask humans to label or give an answer, label data or give an answer, then they don't necessarily agree upon this one answer. And there is various reasons why they can do so. And so uh, I'm 100% sure all of you have encountered this problem because you work with data, which is so central. And so the, the, this problem of disagreement in human annotation is really everywhere. And um, what I would like to put forward here is, you know, okay, it actually impacts all of these three stages that I've just outlined, right? It impacts data, modeling, and evaluation. Um, but we often kind of try to resolve it, learn a gold standard or get a gold standard, and then, you know, just consider it at the data stage. But hey, what about, you know, the modeling part? How, how about the evaluation part? How isn't that a problem which essentially is much more important than just on the data side? So I believe it's really crucial that we, you know, look into this problem more because human disagreement is an important notion or source of uncertainty as well, right? This can, could be part of the variation that we observe. And so <clears throat> I want to ask or see this as, hey, can we actually take advantage of this disagreement? and turn it into something which is actually positive, right? So typically we don't want it. So I, I propose to look at this at, as some sort of fortuitous data. And fortuitous data, what does it mean? It's, it's data out there that we can, uh, we can also collect. Maybe it's not collected uh, for the problem at hand or we didn't think of it in the beginning, but essentially here is a kind of a typology of what sources of fortuitous data might be out there. And annotation and disagreement on annotation is like one source of this fortuitous data. And why, um, so I fear characterized it into two kind of dimensions. One is avail availability. It's perhaps not, annotation disagreement is actually unfortunately not so much available today. Luckily, this is improving. It's increasing, I will show you later. Um, but it's kind of readily available, right? If we know we have this disagreement, it's actual label, so we can use it quite directly compared to other sources of additional information. Say, if you lose uh, cognitive behavioral data, right? That's much more distant from the language signal, so we need to find ways to refine it. But that's the key idea. So it's available, not so much increasing, but it's quite readily um, um, exploitable for our systems. Right, um, just a notion or a side remark. Um, I typically talk about disagreement. We talk about disagreement, um, but I would really like to propose to call it a little bit different here. And so while I still talk about disagreement sometimes, but I want to put forward this term human label variation. And what I mean here is to embrace uh, all the sorts of kind of kinds of disagreement or plausible disagreement that we do see. And I think it's preferable over the term disagreement alone, because disagreement really says that there, there's like two or more views cannot hold at the same time. So um, I uh, here le would like to put forward this term in order to embrace different notions that found in different literatures, which talk about human uncertainty or perspectivism or uh, hard cases and so on, and just propose to use, okay, this is all variation in human labeling. And uh, one, one important point here is also that, you know, while we might see uh, variation in labeling that might stem from different causes, we also have this clear case, clear, there's also annotation errors, right? So in this talk, I try to assume that the variation that we observe is genuine, and but there is also this notion of okay, something is clearly an error, right? And I will come back to this um, this discussion in the later part of the talk. Yeah, all right. So um, having set the motivation for this talk, I will move now into these three parts. I first show you example cases uh, by looking at actual data, and you know, let's let's see what kind of variation we observe. Then I will move into modeling. And the question now is, how can we actually make use of this kind of uh, human level variation? And in the last part, I want to move into evaluation and touch up on this uh, important aspect as well. All right, is there any question at this point? No, okay, then I will just uh, 
feel free to interrupt me. So um, let's delve into the data. And now I will show you a couple of examples of uh, human level variation. So um, we know, for instance, from, you know, even part of speech tagging, there are very linguistically hard cases. And here is a nice paper by Manning uh, who discussed uh, what does it take to go from 97% accuracy to 100%. And here is an example, just a, an illustration. <clears throat> social media are massive, and we might observe that social media can be tagged as adjective noun or noun noun compound. Um, so some of these disagreements are, in fact, what this example shows is some of these are also uh, observable in quite a kind of objective linguistic tasks, right? Um, but let's look further. So there's also work by Chris Welfi and uh, Laura Ayoyo from Amsterdam. They looked a lot into medical relation extraction. So if you take this example here, these data suggest that the subclinical ribofilin Mm, maybe due to this, you know, intake of, mm, and asked annotators to to come up with what is the relation. Then we do observe that there is this this range of plausible answers that come out. Another, you know, more objective task is also in the dependency policy. We might see that there are cases which are not so clear cut, like here, this example from Lewidall on whether there is, a, you know, the a zero copula construction or class, for, class modified noun, either of these two trees that we see are plausible. Another big area is natural language inference. So here we have a hypothesis and a premise, and we want to know whether the premise implies the hypothesis. And uh, this task also earlier known as uh, recognizing textual entailment, for example, for this for this uh, pair, Amanda carried the package from home and Amanda moved. We actually see that the original entailment relation was proposed, but then there was a study by Ellie Public and Tom Kotkowski who re-annotated and re-asked human annotators. And what they found is this distribution here. So where on the right, you see that entailment is the most, is the prediction by humans, but you also see that you know, not all the humans were actually going for an entailment relation, but there's also this big chunk of neutral uh, annotations in the in the data. So there is much more, actually. I'm just giving you a couple of uh, handpicked, uh, selected examples. Um, there is a huge area now also in abusive or offensive language detection, and here are some of the references. So there, you might imagine, right, if you ask people to annotate tweets for what's offensive. Uh, you might get even very, very much more variation even than for other tasks. So the question is how, how and what can you do, do in that area? Uh, and now a little bit moving towards uh, computer vision. There's also work in something like visual question answering where typically um, there is an image and there is an, a question related to that image. So here is, for instance, one by the paper by Jolly et al. What's the pattern of the little girl's dress? And what these systems are typically trained on is, although the human annotators were, were allowed, you know, these are the answers in red here, they are trained on just the majority vote, in this case, plates, which is kind of what they agree on. But there is also like, where is this, right? And it looks like, you know, it's much more harder to say, okay, road or outside, right? Why, why choose one of the two options for training the system? In this case, for instance. Um, so, um, you know, this, this gives you hopefully an idea of the range of tasks where this might be super relevant, but let's look a little bit at, um, you know, can, is this actually something random or can we uh, find some systematicity to this? And this is a study that we did uh, uh, in 2014 when we actually annotated ourselves some parts of, uh, part of speech text. Uh, where we don't also wanted to know, can we uh, estimate them from small samples? So we annotated back then uh, parts of the Wall Street Journal, but also another domain like Twitter data. And here you see the, the confusion plot between the part of speech tags in these two samples. And what we found is that there is some system systematicity across these types of genres, where for instance, adjective and uh, noun were quite frequently uh, confused. Or, um, but also there, there's some, some um, domain specific confusions in this data as well. But overall, it looks like, right, the pattern is, is kind of similar across these domains. 
So we can say that there is not, this is not just randomly distributed, but we can look at these confusion matrices and even from small annotated data, get a sense of how, what are frequent um, uh, variations in annotation. And then another question you might ask, hey, now we saw that, uh, you know, this looks, there is some systematicity to it, but what about, um, you know, typically we want to get rid of it and try to get to this gold standard, right? And now, if you think about this in another way, it's kind of a distribution where you pick the mode of the distribution or majority vote. And so another way of looking at this, are these human labor variation distributions unimodal? Or, you know, do they contain more like signal to them? So um, you can see, imagine it like this, right? Uh, unimodal distribution. And so what uh, this nice work by Ali Pavlik uh, was doing is referring back to the example I gave you earlier. So they looked at re-annotating these um, uh, NLI data points. And what you see here now is two examples. And they were then trying to uh, re, um, so um, estimate the distributions. And they found that, uh, you know, if you were like looking at this right example, Paula swatted the fly. The swatting happened in a forceful manner. And now here, the one means entailment, zero is neutral and minus one would be um, 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 the opposite of entailment. Now it doesn't come to my mind. But what the main key thing is that if you were to plot a, a unimodal distribution, this would be the distribution, but you see that there is a better fit of a bimodal distribution on this data. So there is not just one mode, right? That, best fits. So what they did, is, in fact, they used Gaussian mixer models to fit to this data. And then they found that, in fact, for around 20% of the data, there's a non-trivial second component that explains this variation. I, think I really like this, this type of uh, study because it's looking again at uh, the data and questioning the gold truth that we typically use. And so what can we say about this question? Yeah, is human labor variation when you model? No, at least for many tasks, you can find more variation in this data. And this means also there is more signal, right? In this data annotations. So I would say, yes, human labor variation is signal. The question is then, okay, how do we make use of that? And uh, now you might ask, hey, yeah, as I asked you before, right? How many sticks are there? There might be many different reasons to why you came up with different answers. And that's another important aspect to this. So maybe it's because of the characteristics of the stimulus, but also there might be individual differences or cultural differences. But also another aspect, which, which is very interesting, I believe, is the context and the, and the attention of the person paying to the task. So, um, there is a lot to be done in order to under, also understand the sources of this variation. Um, another very recent work by uh, Yang and de Manef is um, um, a very nice tackle paper. So they looked, they tried to look uh, post hoc into reasons for disagreement in NLI data. And they came up with a linguistically motivated taxonomy of different explanations of why there is a certain explanation or uh, divergence in the annotations because it's really nice work as well and more more of this sort of work is also needed in order to understand the phenomenon all right are you all with me still yes i hope so so let's see and uh, now i hope i i convinced you all uh, to that uh, there is a lot of variation in human annotation and now the question is how can we make use of this and uh, here I will go into the modeling part and essentially propose to you a type of a little taxonomy of directions that we might take. Okay, so we observed human labor variation. So one, one path or one research strand is actually, hey, we, we don't want it. We want to resolve it and go to a single ground truth, or we want to get to quality data that doesn't contain this variation. So here we can think of two sub areas. One is uh, aggregation methods, right? And the other one is instead of um, as well, filtering the data, trying to get to those instances where uh, human laborers uh, agree on 
Then the opposite trend or strength is actually to say, hey, let's embrace the variation. Okay. And now here, if you look at the literature again, we might see two kinds of ways in order to embrace this variation. And so you, we can think about, okay, learn actually from the unintegrated data. That's one direction, okay? Or um, try to enrich the, the standard way of learning from a one ground truth with this kind of variation and see what it brings us. So here are a couple of directions and methods that have been proposed in NLP, but also beyond. So this is really also something that bridges areas. And uh, I will go into showing you examples for each of these methods now in the next step. All right, so for aggregation, you know, we have here our documents and say we have our three annotators. And now the typical way of aggregating is in fact, trying to find this one label, right? And there is, you know, a lot of methods here. And then in fact, you learn only from the last step, right? That's the typical setup. So this is most widely adopted, but it also allows us only to model one view, one label, one perspective. Another approach is to filter the data. So there are um, um, directions who argue for this, saying, okay, if there is too high disagreement, then we shouldn't use that data point. And in fact, you would end up with a model that still learns on the aggregated data, but with actually even fewer information, fewer instances. So this kind of neglects the human nuances, and in my view, is also wasting data, right? So this is a kind of, could be a very interesting case why there is this disagreement here. And so from, from the other two perspective, hey, let's actually try to embrace the human labor variation. We can try or see methods that try to learn directly from the multiple annotations, right? Um, so you learn from unintegrated data, and this is actually embracing all the variation there is, right? But of course, our methods are not typically set up in this way. So um, while there are methods available, like multi-labeling by Sheng et al., also more architecture-specific um, uh, directions, the, the key takeaway here from that line of work is so far, that direct learning from the unintegrated data labels is not yet showing the promise that potential it could keep. So this is not yet at the stage that the methods, if you use this directly, you're typically actually falling behind all the ways. Um, also, I'm pointing here to a study by UMA at all, where we looked at several ways uh, over several tasks and found that this is typ was typically lagging behind others in NLP. So I think more, more work is needed, more also new methods are needed to directly allow us to learn from unintegrated data. Instead, what is currently at least the best uh, direction is enriching the goal to uh, distributions. So here you take, you know, the, the sum of the two uh, pieces and try to learn from both aggregated and raw labels. And in fact, this is, you know, like embracing the nuances while still keeping this one ground true idea. And you could see this as kind of a regularization effect, right? Because you are learning from this distribution besides learning from one ground truth. So two, two examples from this last step is a model that we proposed in 2014 with uh, Dirk Koe and Anna Sogard. We, are, we, we essentially took these confusion matrices and proposed a cost-sensitive weighting mechanism. And the idea is, okay, when you update your model, you actually update it less on cases where humans disagree. So essentially smoothing your model according to the label distribution. Um, more recently, we proposed another direction, which we saw was more fruitful in many tasks and that's soft label multitask learning. The idea here is normally you have your single task model, you're learning your output and then you have a single ground truth and you back propagate from the single ground truth. But we saw that we can actually do the same here with, you know, you have the typical single task, but then we use secondary objective where we say, okay, now instead of just learning from the ground truth, we also learn from the distribution, try to match this. And that was um, its advantages because you have only one auxiliary hat. Um, 
And you know, this, it's not a new idea to do multitask learning with multiple annotations, but it was different from other approaches where each, uh, each hat is essentially one annotator, but we here take the global distribution essentially. And we saw that this gave us quite good results across tasks. So here is just an example for two of the tasks we were looking at, post tagging and stemming. And we saw that uh, it was helping us consistently to improve the, uh, the, um, the tasks accordingly. Another example from learning from this kind of data is learning from unintegrated labels. So there's a method called deep learning from crowds. And what that does is it actually tries to learn each annotator specific label at the output layer. So it adds a crowd layer on top where it keeps, so to say, the beliefs that each of the annotators has. <clears throat> and then we tried this on with three really brilliant uh, bachelor students back at ITU. We created this data set of um, understanding indirect answers to polar questions. So you want to just spend a little bit of time on this. So um, the problem is here, you have a, a polar question like, hey, everything okay? and you have an answer. So we humans are very good in not answering directly, right? Exactly. And now the, the problem is, what did the human mean with this answer? Mm -hmm. And so uh, in this data, we saw that when we annotated this, there is a lot of, you know, on 75%, the three annotators agreed up, but there is 25% of the data where there was disagreement between the meaning of these English question answer pairs. And so uh, what the students then did is uh, look at, hey, if we train a bird model, and since we have all of the data triply annotated, look at the predictions. And what we found is, in fact, the, um, the incorrect predictions are higher for cases where the humans don't agree on, right? So this is really incorrect predictions on instances where the humans also provide diverging annotations. So they tried one of these uh, methods to try to improve upon just learning from a single ground truth. And what we saw is in fact, so here is uh, the, the model of uh, just bird model. And here we are trying the crowd layer on top. What we found is, okay, this method could help us improve the F1 score over this quite skewed class distribution. But it was not, you know, if you look at the, uh, instead of accuracy, it wasn't helping consistently in all of the cases. And that was also due to this huge disbalance. And for the majority answer, um, it wasn't helpful. So more, more, more work is needed here. But you know, a side effect of this model is also that you get back these uh, confusion matrices per annotator and you really see back essentially the, the annotation divergences that you can see also from the data. Um, right, so these are two example studies that we did. Um, now I want to show you a little bit more uh, related work, which is different, but I think is highly also giving more evidence that there is, in fact, uh, a lot to be done in this direction. So one is um, uh, data maps. So this, this is a framework that was proposed by Swapna and co-workers in ACL. So she, they proposed it in EMIP 2020. But she gave a very nice talk at ACL this year, where she showed, in fact, yet again, this idea, okay, there is, you know, you learn when training the model, you can essentially afterwards, if you track the confidence and the correctness over time, during the epochs, you can devise these maps. And what these maps show you is essentially, okay, these are cases of instances where the model is very, very unsure, but it doesn't change its mind. While these are cases where it's really, you know, unsure and the confidence is also in the middle, so it's not sure and changes its mind. So these are kind of what they call the ambiguous cases. And what they show is, in fact, then when you train uh, a model on all of the data, you get these yellow bars here. But what is interesting is if you train <clears throat> the model on only ambiguous cases, so on a subset of data, less data, then you can actually get a model which is similarly uh, uh, good in, in, the, in, in the same distribution. But if you then bring it to another data distribution, you actually can get a more robust model. So this is kind of very interesting, I think. So it helps, help, training on, on ambiguous or so hard cases can help you to create a more 
a better model out of distribution. Okay. Um, we took this idea of data maps as well. So this is Mike. This is one of my PhD students. And we were interested in, hey, can we actually kind of make use of this map, uh, or actually a smaller map with fewer data instances, and learn a better acquisition function for active learning? So in active learning, you need to choose the next data item that you need to model, to, to label, right? And there's a lot of literature, but um, often you take the one where the model is the least confident. And that means, in this case, you would sample from that distribution over here. And this is often, if you give them annotated those instances, they are often very, very difficult to annotate as well, right? Um, while we also know from the previous study that there's a lot of benefit by using the ambiguous cases, not just the hard cases, right? A, a good mix of different sort of data is, is good. So we, what we were doing is essentially trying to tease apart this boundary between the hard cases and the rest of the data in order to try to learn another acquisition function. And we saw in this work that the red line is essentially our proposed, so these are also called data maps or cartography. And we saw that using this can give us yeah, a, a, a promising, I wouldn't say it outperforms based on this curve, but it shows it, this idea can have some benefits to, to take on as, as inspiration for labeling. All right. Um, so learning with human label variation, there's a lot to be done. I hope I gave you some ideas as well, hopefully. Um, there is increasing interest, which is great to see, but there's also, fragmented research in different, even within NLP, we see a lot of, for instance, work on NLI, but not so much in other areas. Um, but we also lack diverse data sets. So that's why I'm grateful to be here because I hope I, I get uh, you know, to talk to you and convince you also that there is a really a need for NLP and core machine learning research to get access to multiple annotations or the annotation process itself. And, um, because we know even small samples of um, more rich data can be very helpful if exploited um, consistent or if exploited. At the same time, there's also a lot of new questions emerging like, you know, what if you have data, you know, not for every data item, you have X annotations, but you have varying degrees of annotations and so on. So there's also work a little bit in that direction and connecting these areas is, a, I, find, I think, a, an interesting direction. And as well as connections to other disciplines like human-computer interaction, computer vision, and, and so cognitive science as well, from which we can learn uh, how to best integrate the human, essentially. Um, I want to just point you to this JAR survey that we wrote uh, on learning from disagreement for more methods more overview and an empirical evaluation of different methods. All right, but let me bring, uh, go to the last part. So I will briefly touch up on evaluation as well, because now the question arises, okay, we learn from these distributions, but how do we evaluate in light of these, right? And um, this is a huge open problem, I would say. So we tried to condense the ongoing literature into this uh, kind of opinion piece last year. We need to talk about disagreement in narration. This is joint work with many, many people that you see here. Um, but we, we try to essentially put this importance into highlight because um, when even in our own work, when learning from disagreement, when trying to integrate this into our models, we essentially often still evaluate against the ground truth, right? So we are essentially missing out on the relation part because the single correct answers ignores all these facets that I just talked about before. And it, it is meaning we focus still on easy evaluation, right? And um, there's also nice work here by Gordon that they did the human evaluation study that using a single metric does not align even with reality, right? Which probably many of you know, actually. Um, so we, it's really, really important to, to start embracing more metrics or even find good ways to evaluate, which is a huge area in itself. So um, some examples of what has been done, and this is just a very short outlook here, is you could measure, for instance, Davani et al. What they did is they measured the one against individual annotators, you know, to see if there is a trend even across annotators 
or there's some idea where you try to essentially find clusters of users. So are you, instead of just global averages, right, find for which cluster of which group of people it works well. There's also this kind of disagreement deconvolution, which is essentially based on this idea of clusters. But you also try to learn um, over user groups. But for each user in that group, you also try to find to model their individual characteristics or their individual primary label. So what label would this annotator have been given in that case, essentially? And um, we believe strongly that you know this kind of evaluation, uh, also where you evaluate against the distribution of annotations, so soft evaluation can really give us more insights into our model. And also it's connected to trustworthiness, right? So if we know how the model, the distribution of the model kind of matches closer to the human distribution, this helps us also move forward in that direction. But to sum up, um, is human labor variation so bad? I hope I answered, I convinced you to, to show, no, it's not bad. It's actually some, an opportunity here that we should explore. Um, and what do we need to do in order to move forward? Uh, well, let's get back to, my, to the very beginning of my talk. I talked about data models and evaluation. And I think we really need to work in all of this to get, to get forward. So one is collecting and releasing more of that sort of data. Um, so I've tried to advocate for this a long time that also there is work by Vinod, for instance, to, um, to they even propose to not just release annotator level labels, but if possible, even release it with meta information about uh, the annotator. Some of this is happening now, also thanks to data statements and so forth. And there is really, really, I'm happy to say it here to you, there's really value in metadata that in NLP or AI often doesn't get used. So I think there is a lot that we can do to learn from the, the crafted hand metadata that you guys are also collecting, right? And so here is a gleam of hope. Uh, I've tried to compile, this is necessarily incomplete, but I've tried to compile resources uh, with uh, variation. And you see that the trend is increasing. More people are putting it out, but hopefully this is you know, growing much more in future. Um, second evaluation. So we really need to go beyond accuracy of single mode evaluations and also uh, go to model uncertainty and try to see not just the output of the model, but also the confidence scores and how well the models are calibrated in order to understand them better. And here is a study again by Davani, and they show in fact that their other multitask learning approach was helping them to get closer to the distribution of the human annotation. So softmax, you know, this is when you do the mode, but if you enrich it with several means, you can do so, you get much closer to the human distribution. That's, I think, an interesting direction, in fact. Um, I want to, to highlight just in one slide some recent work we've been doing. Yeah, if some of you know about calibration, how many are here? Yeah, a few, okay, a few. Um, so just briefly, you know, we, we try to have models that also output confidence is how, 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 how much they believe this is the right answer, right? And what we found is um, very well-known methods on measuring this confidence and trying to what's called calibrate the models. They are severely flawed because they, they still assume there is a single ground truth. And both theoretically and empirically, this is a huge problem that uh, our student, Joris Pan, has shown that there is a paper coming out on ENLP. So we are showing you know, that this, like Etcher, you should be really, really careful with the methods. And there we propose instance level measures to come closer to, to this, uh, or at least propose these instance level measures to measure, capture this human label variation. So just a, an, a shameless plug here for some really nice work done by yours. Um, and finally, the learning part. So there is, you know, there's a lot of in information, there's a lot of possibilities here. And I really hope to you convince you that there is human labor variation and there is a range of variation. And we need to understand this, I would say, continuum, right? Because there is variation, which is clearly useful, but there is also noise and annotation errors. And there is some work in uh, finding and mining annotation errors, 
which is completely this, this de detached nowadays from all of this other work, which tries to use this sort of information. So I think there's a lot also to, to understand this continuum um, and model the data or use this for better modeling, because I believe there's essentially value in thinking about how can we learn from less but highly informative data instead of just throwing, you know, massive amounts of information or massive amounts of text to our models. I think we can go better with less but more informative data. So uh, so take home message, I hope, you know, shown of try to show you that not all human labor variation is noise. We can embrace it in learning. Um, we should not continue to just go to learn the mode, but embrace this collective information. Um, an important aspect is also evaluation and rethink the way we are doing that today. Um, there is a lot of research opportunities. I'm very glad and grateful that part of my ERC is also going in this direction. And um, there is also, uh, if you're interested in this, there's also a shared task that we're organizing on subjective language detection for SEMEVAL 2023. So please participate. And uh, here are two key selected references, which I leave to you. And with that, actually, I will end here. And thanks a lot uh, for listening to me. And I'm looking forward to your questions now. Thank you for the nice talk. Um, my background is in machine translation. Where are you? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. Uh, my background is in machine translation, and there it's pretty common to work with multiple reference translations. So how does your story relate to, um, to tasks where there is not clearly one solution? Or there is, yeah, that's my question. Um... How does my how does my story relate to task where there's not clearly one solution like MT you mean now or yeah yeah yeah, yeah. like like in in an MT metrics it's pretty common to to work with several reference translations yeah. so is that is that an equivalent of your multiple labels from different annotators or or yeah you yeah. could yeah I would say clearly right this idea of multiple annotations is much older especially in IT where you have multiple annotations often right but still even in MT you often have just one reference for 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 reasons of also getting the data it's hard to get multiple references um no you could see that multiple paraphrases of of multiple references can be like human label variation but it's it's necessarily the methods would be different right then because a lot of this work is now in 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 labeled in structured outputs or just in classification outputs instead of generated outputs so um, here is the main key distinction, right? That there, this is a generation task. Um, but I do think also there, I'm, I'm actually wondering if there is any, any work in MT, which is not my area, um, on you know, some translations are more faithful than others and how to model that essentially. So, so subgroups of, of, like you could say different labels, right? But, in terms of different translations, and if you could use that somehow, I don't know, I, I will wonder. Yeah, I'm wondering too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hi there, thank you for the interesting uh, talk. Uh, someone who's worked on active learning sort of systems, I, I, I generally appreciate it. It's a, it's a really hard task and I never really figured it out. <laughs> uh, I have two questions, if that's okay. Uh, the first one has to do with um, what you said about out of domain data, right? Mm -hmm. So sort of thinking from the transfer learning uh, framework, yep. suppose that you've trained a first model um, and you've incorporated un uncertainty into the learning signal, right? Have yep. you by any chance uh, sort of experimented with seeing whether the time to convergence when fine tuning on out of domain data is shorter? Uh, mm, no, we haven't looked at that. That's a good point. We haven't looked at convergence in that area. That could be that, yeah, an interesting idea. Yeah. 
I mean, it ties into the whole, you know, using less data. Yeah, less exactly. That you computer. train faster, right? With rich thing, I would expect so, but yeah, we haven't looked explicitly at time to conversions. It's a good point. Uh, and then just one other question. Um, so again, if you've in incorporate that uncertainty into the learning process do you notice that your that the sort of predicted label distribution uh correlates better with let's say the the entropy of the soft labels does that work better right the, exactly that's ex essentially the, the the summary of that that slide here they did exactly that so they correlated the predicted output the distribution with the human label distribution here is the pearson correlation between these two and these methods which don't use just a single ground truth like the first one and the second one, right? The all the, the last ones, they have show higher Pearson correlations. So yeah, exactly. There is more work in this direction to essentially measure also the KL divergence or so other measures, measurements of divergence to the human distribution. Yeah. And have you also tried the multitask with Monte Carlo dropout? Just by uh, no, 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 we haven't. Uh, no, we haven't. No. All right, cool. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks for the questions. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Barbara, for a wonderful talk. Um, I have a maybe a small, maybe even a bit of a nerdy question, but uh, so so you you make the kind of the intended overstatement that that human uh, annotation variation is signal. Mm -hmm. um, that, that there must be some noise as well, and and uh, I was wondering. Um, so we, we we seem to not get get a grip on that. So it, it's really interesting to see those uh, unimodal and bimodal fits. Uh, still, there is noise because if we, we tend to focus on in, uh, uh, inter annotator disagreement or variation, but there's also intra annotator uh, variation that we. And I was wondering whether you've looked at it or thought about this. So when you ask the same person to annotate the same thing at a different moment. Would they do they make the same decision? And and I'm I'm sure that many annotations are uh, are are random choices made at the uh, in spur of the moment. This is a very good questions, a very good question, um, which I thought about, but I haven't yet come to 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 do myself work in this direction because yeah, this this like I think there is a lot of what we could learn by just looking at how even the intra coder diver like how how the coder is doing over time um uh and learn from that even but then it's hard to tease it's hard to get started because it's hard to get a you know is this just an attention slip now or is it what's happening right um but i do think that there is uh value if we could track it at least one study we did now is um uh, for relation extraction we had uh, we we asked the annotator to mark uncertain cases. So it's not like recoding, but marking. Okay, I'm really I'm unsure about this case, and leave this in the data, and then also evaluate our model against that subset and look at that. So the, a little bit in this direction, but I think there is this is an interesting uh, open box to explore, which most likely you know other areas, not NLP, has done more work in. If you know more, let me know. Um, I know this uncertainty is something very popular in mob psychology, you know, neurolinguistic neuro studies and so on. Um, not so much NLP, but a very good, uh, you know, in general, this idea is if we more know more about the process than the product, then we can learn better about the product. Thank you.